Hello everyone, Victor from OrganicChemistryTutor.com is here, and in this video I want to go over a really fun mechanism challenge. When I posted this mechanism on my Instagram feed, a lot of you commented on it and messaged me about it with the uh, similar questions, and specifically many of you are really curious how the group seemingly jumped around to form this epoxide uh, product that we have at the end. Well, let's look at this mechanism together and see whether things actually jump around or not. And before we go into the details of this mechanism, I suggest you actually pause this video now and give it a try. Then, once you have something worked out, you can see how your ideas match to what's actually happening in this reaction. Alright, so the first step in this mechanism is going to be an acid-base reaction. And how do I know that? Well, sodium hydride, NaH, is an extraordinarily strong base, and it generally does one thing. It deprotonates acidic hydrants. And the hydride in the sodium hydride, this H- species over here, is not particularly nucleophilic, so we don't really expect anything but the acid-base reaction or a proton transfer, if you like, in this reaction. And the most acidic proton here is going to be the proton on the OH group. Um, so while the protons here on the third carbon, so we have H and H over there, while those uh, protons are also somewhat acidic, the pKa of those two protons is about 21, while the pKa of the secondary alcohol is actually close to 17. So uh, with 10 10 10,000 times difference in acidity, uh, we don't really have much of a competition here. So we are going to be deprotonating our OH group and nothing else is going to compete with that. And once that proton is off, we've got a great nucleophilic intermediate here where we have this O- is a wonderful nucleophile that can further uh, react with the electrophiles in our molecule. And here is something I want to point out before we go any further in this mechanism, that is. Uh, here I have the structure that I've made out of my, my molecular model kit, uh, and in this structure we can see uh, the proximity between the OH group, this is my OH group over here, and my two electrophiles. I have one electrophile over here at carbon number seven uh, with the bromine as a leaving group and I have another electrophile over here at carbon number two, which is my carbonyl. And uh, this oxygen over here eventually becomes my O- once we lose this uh, proton. And of course I had to flip this molecule upside down to make it a little bit easier uh, to see the distances and the angles between our atoms over here, but uh, to make it a little bit easier I'm going to keep the consistent numbering of the atoms uh, through this entire video uh, so uh, you can have a reference of where the atoms are moving and what's going on here. Alright, so let's look at the first possible option here. And the first possible option is going to be the nucleophilic attack of the alkoxide that we have on carbon number 5 and the uh, electrophile, which is our carbon number 7, because we have a wonderful living group in the form of a bromine here. This would be your typical SN2 reaction in which you displace the living group, bromine, uh, with an incoming uh, O-, which is going to be our nucleophile. And this gives us the following product featuring the oxetane ring. So oxetane ring is this four-membered ring with an oxygen, and this is where the problem is. The four-membered ring is a rather unstable type of a structure. And you may recall that epoxides, which are the three-membered rings with an oxygen, are even less stable, yet they form easily in a reaction like that. So, in other words, if we have something like this, what I have over here, uh, we don't have any problems with this reaction, and you would be absolutely correct. However, in this type of a reaction where the intramolecular SN2 yields an epoxide, we have a proximity effect in place. Essentially, the proximity of the nucleophile, which is our oxygen here, and the electrophile, which would be this carbon with the leaving group in this case, is a driving force behind the epoxide formation. But if we don't have 
have the reactive uh, centers next to each other, like what we have in our molecule, we have a nucleophile over here, we have a bromine uh, uh, sitting on carbon number seven, there is a little bit more distance between them, they're not right next to each other. So in this case, we do not have a proximity effect. And thus the formation of the oxetane is uh, not going to be driven by, well, anything here. Making a four-membered ring is quite a challenge in chemistry in general, and we only know a handful of methods yielding those, and most of them give rather poor results anyways. So in conclusion we can say that the oxetane, the four-membered ring with an oxygen, the oxetane formation here is rather unlikely. So how about the reaction with the carbonyl? The nucleophile in the reaction with the uh, carbonyl, this oxygen, which is right over here, is rather close to our electrophile at carbon number two, so we can have easily an attack on it. And what's more important in this case is that we're not going to have to deal with any uh, unstable four-membered uh, rings uh, at all. And the intermediates here, they actually feature the cage tricyclic system with five and seven membered rings, all of which are quite stable. And here I've made the molecular model for this structure and I kind of try to draw it, uh, to draw it over here uh, on paper to the best of my drawing ability. And so once we form this... Uh, intermediate, this tetrahedral intermediate, if you like, uh, the way we would, we would call it in the uh, chemistry of esters. We can easily do the uh, living group dissociation, which is, again, a very typical type of a step for uh, tetrahedral uh, intermediate decomposition in the acyl chemistry, and that gives you a living group dissociation, which now going to break the bond between atoms 1 and 2, and giving you another pair of an ester and another alkoxide. And notice how in this molecule, the structure, uh, this molecule is structurally very similar to the original starting material. However, in this case, all groups have kind of shifted around a little bit. And this is perhaps the trickiest part of this entire reaction. The starting material and the product both feature the bicyclic lactone backbone, making them uh, seemingly similar. In reality, though, you can see now that we have changed the atom connectivity in the backbone itself. If before we had them connected in a cyclic fashion like that, now they actually, our uh, atom number one, I almost said carbon, our atom number one, which is oxygen here, is no longer connected to atom number two. And then from here, we have our backbone uh, twisting in a completely different direction from how it used to be originally uh, twisting around. But now we do have our nucleophile and our electrophilic carbon right next to each other. So nothing stops us from doing the SN2 attack between our nucleophile and electrophilic carbon over here, giving the final epoxide. So as you can see, nothing magically jumps around or changes locations or anything like that without any obvious reasons in this uh, reaction. And the tricky part uh, was to catch that bicyclic structure rearrangement, which made the uh, reactive centers appear right next to each other and facilitate the formation of the epoxide products. I hope you folks enjoyed this little mechanism challenge here and learned some new ways of looking at your molecules and analyzing your reactions. And I'll see you next time. And until then, remember to stay awesome.